All right, welcome everyone. We're a minute past the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. This is going to be the uh, live Q&A for Module 4. But before we get into the Module 4 stuff, we will start with the Module 3 quiz. Right, hear me okay? Yep. All right, very good. All right, so the first question on the Module 3 quiz is physical quantities that result from a product of many independent processes have distributions that are approximately, and that answer is going to be log normal. So if we've got a product of many things, it's going to be log normal. It's going to be the sum, then it's going to be normal. So question number two, uncertainty with respect to natural phenomena is known as and that is going to be aleatory uncertainty. Question three, finally getting into a little bit of math. Uh, what is the mean of a PERT distribution with a minimum of 0 0.05, a mode of 0.45, and a maximum of 0.75? So to get the mean of the PERT distribution, if you remember, that distribution is going to weight the mode or most likely value four times more than the minimum and the maximum. So to do this, I'm going to take the minimum, add that to four times the mode, and then add to that the maximum and then divide by six. And when I do that, I should get 0.433. So again, it's the minimum value plus four times the mode plus the maximum all divided by six, and I get 0.433. Question number four, where we start comparing uh, triangular distributions and PERT distributions, and we're asked which of the following statements is true? It's true. First one there, the triangular distribution will give more weight to the tails of the distribution in comparison to the PERT distribution. That is true. Um, second one, the triangular distribution will give less weight to the shoulders of the distribution in comparison to the PERT distribution. That is also true. And then the mean of the triangular distribution is equally sensitive to the min minimum, the mode, and the maximum that define it. And that is also true. So the correct answer is going to be the fourth option there, all the above. All the above. So if you think about the shapes of a PERT distribution versus Triangular distribution, if I had this as a triangular distribution, let's see if I can annotate on here. The triangular distribution would look something like that instead. And as you can see, we're given more weight to the tails than to the shoulders. All right. Then question five, we asked, what is the confidence of the annual, that the average annual life loss is just between 10 to the minus three and 10 to the minus four? So to do that, we need to figure out what the cumulative percentage is in each of these values. So the cumulative percentage at 10 to the minus three is going to be about 75%. And then the cumulative percentage at 10 to the minus 4 is going to be about 15%. So our confidence is going to be the difference of those two values, or 60%. And that's not listed there, so the correct answer to this one is um, none of the above. Any questions on anything from the uh, Module 3 quiz? Uh, I have a question regarding question four. Sure. Um, I, uh, when, when you showed this now, this the sketch, it looked like uh, uh, some of these questions may not be always true. Uh, like for example, when we talk about the shoulders, like uh, or you know, like uh, when you showed the comparison, it looked like it's true on one side, but it's not true on the other side. For example, or is that incorrect? Well, yeah, so if I'm comparing the shoulders here, and again, that's going to be the area just a little bit left or right of the knee, I'm getting 
more here than I am here, and I'm getting more here than I am there. So, oh, so that doesn't extend further out. Okay, I see what you mean. You're just really yeah. just next to the peak. Yeah, and it's more evident and especially obvious when you're looking at um, symmetrical distributions. So, what I would say was, you know, when when we talk about how we define these distributions, when we're dealing with a PERT distribution, it's really important to, to fully define those tails. Whereas with the triangular distribution, getting all the way out there is not quite as important because it's going to give more weight to them anyway in the long run. Mm. Does that make sense? Thanks. Yep. Good question. Any other questions? All right, with that, let's start with, uh, get to homework number four now. So in homework number four, we were asked to, let me go over here real quick. So in homework number four, we were asked to use RMC uh, QRA calcs to do some risk calculations um, for a particular project. Uh, we were told to do a thousand iterations if we had that risk. If not, to do it deterministically. And we'll show how to do that. The, the process is essentially the same, so I'll show it both ways. And then we needed to send a screenshot of the FN plot to get credit. So. The data we're given, we're given a um, hydrologic hazard where we've got the um, fifth, 95th percentiles along with expected value for that stage frequency curve. We have our exposures, breach life loss for day and night, non-breach life loss for day and night, economic costs, and then when we get down here, we've got estimates for overtopping, backward erosion piping, and concentrated leak erosion. So in the uh, video presentation, I went through and showed how to set up basically everything from start to finish for failure mode one. So for this one, instead of doing failure mode one, I'm gonna do failure mode two, but repeat some of the initial steps. So to get started, we need to um, download the uh, RMC QRA Calcs toolbox, and that can be found on the RMC website. Once we get to the RMC website, we'll go under Software, Toolboxes, and then QRA Calcs, and then we can click Download here. I've already got the, um, the zip file that you download on my desktop, so I'll just work from there, but that's how you would get to it. All right, so once I've got that downloaded and pulled up, I'll have to extract those files. The way I always do it, I just highlight them and then drag them down to a folder so that I can run things. So I've got those there, and because I'm working on a government computer, I need to right-click and unblock all this stuff. We don't need the team elicitation worksheet for this. Um, that's really helpful when you're going through and estimating the system response. Kind of puts things in the right format for you, but not something this homework. All right. So to start with, I need to work with the RMC stage frequency distribution worksheet. This particular worksheet is what, if I'm doing a probabilistic analysis, is what's going to take the data from my H&H um, &H engineer and try to fit a distribution to it so that we can replicate the results that they're getting out of other tools. And other tools typically going to be um, RF, RMC, RFA. So, um, those next to each other. All right. So initially I got a cover sheet. If we wanted to, we can put the project name in there if we want. 
your name, whatever. Um, but the real stuff starts here on the stage frequency inputs tab. And we're gonna have places to input, again, the fifth percentile, 50th, 95th, and the mean. So in the data that we were given, we've got the same um, stages that define each of these. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start by copying that row, or excuse me, that column of data, and I'm gonna paste it into each of these since they're gonna be the same for all of them. So then next, I need to copy and over the specific AEPs for each of the different percentiles. The fifth percentile, 50th percentile, ninety-fifth, and then lastly the expected or mean value. Okay. So once I've done that, it should look something like this. Um, there's a couple things built into the spreadsheets to make sure that you put your data in correctly. Like, for example, if um, instead of, let's say I had mistyped this number and put in 513, for example, which is less than 529 and a half, I'll get an error value and it'll um, highlight that red. And it'll also give me an error a, or indication that there's an error by making the square in the top left corner red. Um, another important thing to note is at the end, all three of these values need to be exactly the same. If they're not, then we can't define a distribution for that particular stage. So if I had been at 592.1, for example, I get this error here, again, alerting me that the maximum stages and all the relationships are not consistent. Now, in your example, you got you know, all four of these relationships have this end in the same peak pool. That's not always gonna be the case with the data that's given to you, particularly for like the fifth percentile and sometimes the 50th percentile, it's not gonna go all the way out there. So that's the reason for this plot. Sometimes we have to visually extrapolate um, these curves to get relationships that then will work. Now, I know in previous modules, we talked about not extrapolating. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be dealing with probabilities that are so small that it's gonna have essentially no impact on the final estimate. Um, and really, we're just trying to make something that works so that we can, again, fit a distribution that's gonna get us the expected value that we want. And you might have to go through a little bit of trial and error to get there, but it's usually not too bad just kind of extending this curve out, you know, making sure we get up to that same point, and then you'll be able to um, play with the distribution on the next tab. All right, so that's the stage frequency inputs tab. And then from there is where we're actually gonna go pick our, uh, our probability distribution. So in this spreadsheet, it pulls in our data. Um, it's gonna pull in a set of stages and the 50th and 95th expected all gets pulled over. So we are told in the homework file to use a PERT distribution, I believe, or it says to use the most appropriate, okay? So typically what we'll do is we'll start with a PERT distribution and see if it'll fit the data. You can, you've got three options there, beta PERT, inverse Gaussian and uniform. Got to stay away from uniform if you can help it. Uh, we pick beta pert, drag that down for everything. And if we have a good distribution, we shouldn't get errors over here. In fact, the reason we have errors right now is because I'm not running at risk. So I'll get that open. Um, if you're running things deterministically, you can stop here because the only data that you're gonna need comes from uh, column C through um, H, whether we assign a distribution or not, 
if I'm doing things deterministically, the spreadsheet is only going to pull the expected value, it's not going to pull anything else. But if we're doing things probabilistically, we need that distribution, and it's good to check to make sure it works before you um, run it in the other spreadsheets. All right, so I have um, at risk and um, loaded now into Excel. My errors went away. Um, at this point, if you compare the expected values to each other, they're not going to be particularly close. And the reason being is um, it needs to run first. So if I go over here, um, I've got my data in, I've got my distribution set, I'm ready to simulate. Before I do that, let's check our settings and make sure we have everything correct. So if you're working from a government computer or your IT disables um, automatically running macros, then you're going to need to disable multiple CPUs. Unfortunately, that makes things run slower. That kind of is what it is. Um, so make sure that that's disabled. And then on sampling, we want to make sure that smart sensitivity analysis is also disabled. So from there, we're ready to click simulate. We'll get a message about the correlation matrix, we want to click yes by design. And then this, this spreadsheet is usually pretty quick. It only takes you know, 20, 30 seconds to go through. So we'll go ahead and run that one. Went ahead and did 10,000 because in a typical risk assessment, that's what we're going to do. And we want to make sure that our distribution is going to fit our, our data well. All right, that's complete, and you'll notice we don't get a perfect match, but we get a much better match between our expected value from the distribution and then what was originally given to us from the analysis. So a quick and easy way to compare that is we go to the stage frequency plot. Uh, the lines, the dashed lines, are for the input data, and then the actual points are for the output data. So after we run a simulation, we want our output data to plot directly on each of these lines, and they do. Again, we're not going to get an absolute perfect match, but, I mean, they should be pretty close and should look something like this. So this one looks pretty good. Okay. So before moving into the next spreadsheet, which will be uh, the PFM risk, is there any questions on what we just did with this first one? And again, if questions come up, you can feel free to just interrupt, ask a question over the phone, or you can always type it into the, the chat as well. All right, so that one's set now. So the next thing we need to do is we need to get our um, individual PFM risk spreadsheets set up. Let's go back here. So I'm gonna work through um, PFM2 Again, you're going to have to basically do this next set of steps for each failure mode that was given in the homework file. Um, I've got another project risk sheet that's already kind of set up for failure modes one and three, so you won't have to watch me pull it in three times, but get into PSM2. All right, so I got our PFM risk spreadsheet opened up. Uh, similar deal with the cover sheet. You can put your project name, prepare. Um, this is a chance to put your failure mode number in. This one is back where I was in typing. I didn't give them to you, but I, if you have, you know, specific short descriptions that describe each of the, the nodes, this would be the spot to put that in so reviewers can see what each node stands for. Uh, there's also options to um, highlight specific peak stages with uh, reference lines and all the plots that we'll look at later. I'm not gonna punch any in, but typically we'll put things like top of active storage or PMF or top of dam, things like that in here. Okay, all right, so in the spreadsheet, I've got 
all these black tabs, that's going to be for your hydrologic hazard, your life loss, economic costs, and then our calculations and results. And then we've got the individual node worksheets, and that's where the nodal data is going to be put in. So let's start with the hydrologic hazard. Well, the hydrologic hazard, again, is going to come from our um, RMC stage frequency distribution spreadsheet. And we're going to copy um, cell C8 down to H57. So that's going to be this entire table here. Now, if your data doesn't go all the way down to the bottom of the table, we still need to copy the entire table, including any of the dashes that might be down at the bottom. I'm going to copy that whole thing, and then we're going to paste over here as values. That should pull in. Again, the stage frequency relationships, and it plots it over there on the right so that you can compare and make sure that everything was pulled in properly. Okay. The other thing that we put in on this worksheet is going to be the, um, uh, the peak stage is used to evaluate the system response. So this is going to be failure mode specific. These are going to be the stages that um, we're going to evaluate at each node. I go to back to the homework file, scroll down. Each and every one of these um, nodal estimates uses these same peak pools. So I can copy these pools and then paste them over here, but I'm going to have to paste special to transpose them. So I'm going to paste them as values and click transpose, and then I have those in there. So any peak stage that you're going to want to evaluate has to be in this table right here. And you can always go back and add them later if you want. Like, for example, let's say for whatever reason I wanted to add, um, I don't know, pick an elevation. Let's say I wanted 588, something in between these two. I could copy this down and add 588, and that won't mess up anything in any of these other nodes. That's a helpful feature that we added because in the past, and doing elicitations, you think you have all the elevations that you want to evaluate, and then you find that you leave one out, and then it was kind of a pain to try to go back and add those in. But everything's set now that you don't have to change any of the prior numbers evaluated when you add a pool. So looking at the chat, I think I got questions is will the non at risk plot look the same? It'll look pretty similar. It's yeah, th this plot will look exactly the same if you're not using at risk. All right, so I got my hydrologic hazard in. So next, I'm going to input my life loss. My life loss is going to come from these tables. And the life loss I gave you, gave you were the same for all three failure modes. I can start with the exposure, copy and paste in as values. I should have mentioned that earlier with the uh, age frequency distribution spreadsheet. Anytime I'm pasting into these yellow cells, I want to paste as values. The only time that that's different is when um, the cells are highlighted by a red box, and we'll, we'll show one of those examples here in a minute. All right, so we're told to use a beta distribution, beta per distribution for breach and non breach life loss. I will select that from the drop down, click execute. Spreadsheet will do some stuff, hopefully. There we go. All right, so now I'm ready to copy and paste my data in. So this is for the breach day life loss. Values. And the way this is set up is the spreadsheet will automatically calculate your mean based on the min, most likely, and maximum value. So that was for the day. Put the night in there. So 
that's all set. And then we can do the non-breach, same procedure. Right. Everything comes in correctly. Again, the square in the top left will be gray. If there's errors, it turns to red. Similar stuff with the error checking. If um, things are out of order or your um, the values that you've input for these relationships don't make sense. For example, if your most likely was greater than your max, you'll get an error. And the spreadsheet will alert you. Okay. That completes the life loss tab, and we'll do basically the same thing for the economic cost. Um, one thing that's different about the economic cost is we don't typically um, evaluate uncertainty for the economic side of things. Um, we put more effort into the um, estimates for life safety because life safety is paramount. All right, so I've copied and pasted in the economic cost here. That should be oops, back to where we were there. So that's all the, I guess, the base inputs for our hazard and for our consequences. Next, we're going to need to put in the estimates for the individual nodes. That's down here on this worksheet. We're going to do TSM2, except I think I've already pasted in the, um, yeah, the values for PSM1. So let's change those. Values we need come down here from PSM2. These guys right here. All right, that's better. All right, so when looking at these, anytime uh, a node is dependent on pool, you'll see that there's more stages to evaluate. Um, when the nodes are independent of pool, there are typically just two peak pool elevations. Um, for these spreadsheets, the only thing we have, we have to make sure that we define the minimum and the maximum. So if it's independent, you can define all of them if you want and put the same values in for all of them. You'll get the same result. But, I mean, as long as you have the min and the max for your uh, pool independent nodes, that should suffice. All right, so for node one, we've got our two peak pools. Within the spreadsheet, again, this is set up for um, to be helpful during an expert elicitation. This would be the spot where we would take um, a values um, for each estimator and gives you some helpful statistics. And if we need a second response, we have the option to add that here. But really, it's all about boiling all that down to a consensus team estimate. And the only thing that's going to be used is the um, consensus consensus estimate for the team. All right, so the probability distribution for this first node that we're told to use is going to be triangular. We can pick that from our drop down here. This one is going to be independent of stage, so we choose that selection, and then click execute. And what that just did is it pulled those distributions over into the risk calculations tab which we'll look at here in a little bit. All right, so once that's pulled in, I can then copy my nodal estimates, three-point estimates, my low, most likely, and high, paste those in there, and that should be all the inputs I need for node one. Um, some helpful things that the spreadsheet will give you, it'll give you a plot of the estimates versus stage. You can see they're the same value here because it's independent of stage and also give you a look at your uh, probability density function so we can actually see the distributions that we're defining, okay? So from there, we're gonna repeat this process for all the other nodes in the spreadsheet. Um, 
before I get to that, I've got a couple questions in the chat. Looks like one says in your life loss tab, cells A through A3 through A71 are red, but can't figure out what the error is. Tell you what, after we get finished, if you want to hang on the line, you can share your screen with me and I'll walk through and troubleshoot and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Yeah. So um, just to add to that, my cells A1 and 2 is gray, <clears throat> but not A3 and below. So, okay. Yeah. Same for node 1, 2 for some reason. A3 through A71. And the first two uh, rows are. Uh, Great. Anyway, oh, okay. On. Mm -hmm. on your life loss tab. So all of the everything in column A below is red. Yep. Column. And this is the same okay. trend for node one and yeah, also yeah. Two. Okay. So, yep. I'm fine. So th this entire bar will turn red if you have your simulation results pulled in. And I'll show that here in a minute. The reason I have that in there is if for whatever reason you want to, you've run a simulation and you want to change something and rerun it, you want to make sure that you clear the results. So that just alerts you that you have simulation results and you've pulled them into the spreadsheet. It'll, it'll make more sense here in a little bit when I, um, after I run the simulation. That's, the, that's not. The error message is only for the um, the box in the top left corner. Does that make sense? Yep. <clears throat> yep. Thank you. Very good. We'll we'll show more on that here in a little bit. All right. The next question was for the non-breach economic loss suggested in the video that you do not enter the first two zero value rows. But now that I've copied all over the page. Okay. Yeah. So so for this particular example so from the video we had i think in the past i had given uh, as part of the homework only a small portion i'd only given like um i don't think i had these zeros in here for the non-breach life loss so what happens is if i come in when we get to the Risk calculations tab, and this is more important when we get to the project risk. You'll see how I have peak stages for the life loss that then line up with peak stages for economic loss. If these tables don't line up right, when I pull them into the summary spreadsheet, I'm going to have issues because the summary spreadsheet is going to use these stages and then assume that these economic losses go with these stages. They need to be the same. Like right now, they're not. So if I try to pull that into my summary spreadsheet, I'm going to get a mistake. I'm going to have an error in there. So that was what that warning was all about. We want to make sure that we have the same peak stages that define our life loss as we do that define our economic loss or economic cost. So we need to figure out what's going on and why I got extra ones and what's missing here. Looks like I got an extra one in here for the life loss, not in the economic cost. Yeah, so I have an extra stage here in the life loss than I do for the economic cost. So you'll see that's partially intentional. You'll, you'll see what happens when we pull it into the, the summary spreadsheet. Now, there's the spreadsheet can handle it. The spreadsheet will calculate everything correct, whether those uh, columns match or not. But we'll have an issue when we pull things into the risk summary sheet. So that was left there. We'll, I'll, I'll show you um, what happens and what, why that's in there here in a little bit. Okay. All right, so back into the nodes. So I've got node one complete. We'll move into node two. 
So node two is also pool independent. So I'll pick my lowest, pick my highest. I'm using a triangular distribution again. I want it to be independent. And I can copy and paste those values in. Same thing for node three, except this time I've got all the stages. I can go through and select each one individually, or I can just click where it says peak stage, and it's going to pull in the uh, the values that I defined earlier on the hydrologic hazard tab. It pulls those in directly. All right, so I have those. Scroll down here. Triangular, this time I want it to be dependent on stage. Execute, and we can pull those values over. And this is where, especially for those things that are um, dependent on pool, that's when it becomes important to really start looking at our plots. What I've noticed is elicitors tend to put similar, I guess, a similar change in their probabilities as they move from lower probability to or lower pool to higher pool regardless of how those pools change. So we want to make sure that that relationship makes sense with how the um, pool changes. That's why that plot's in there. So repeat for node four. This one's also pool dependent. Copy these in. Node 5 is going to be pool independent this time. Node 6 doesn't even have a distribution to it. This one is probably something like supporting a roof. Um, because there's no probability distribution, I don't need to change anything. I can just punch in both of those values. Actually, we're both ones. That set. Um, up to this point, every node that I've been defined have defined have been failure nodes. Uh, node seven is going to be an intervention node. So we have the uh, drop down here at the top, and we need to choose intervention. So by policy, we have to apply our risk estimates both with and without intervention. So any node that is an intervention node needs to be flagged as such. And then the spreadsheet knows which ones are intervention, which ones are not, and then it'll split it out and um, do the computation for both of those um, estimates. All right, so that is going to be pool dependent. We'll click each stage to bring all those in. Stage dependent, execute. Copy and paste those in. And then lastly, we've got one more node, just back to being a failure node. And then this one is also pool dependent, probably for breach. All right, so I have all the inputs for the nodes, so I can um, this. All right, so now that I have all my inputs, I can go to the risk calculations tab. Now on this tab, it's going to pull all that nodal data in here and summarize it in this table right here. So it's got our distribution, whether it's independent or dependent, all our peak stages. You'll notice that for the um, for the independent stage independent nodes that we only defined with two stages, it has gone ahead and interpolated for those um, middle pools and pulled the same values over. All right, so that's all set. 
In the next spot, we have the option to choose our interpolation method. We'll leave it as semi-log here, but you can do linear or z-variate like we've talked about in um, prior course modules. And then it, it's going to pull those numbers down and distributions over so that we have our both our system response without intervention and then our system response with intervention. So if you look um, down here, it's pulling over that triangular distribution that we specified on the, the nodal sheet in different places. So that's all pulled there. Later, we're going to copy these formulas over into the uh, project risk spreadsheet. That set, it pulled in our uh, frequency data. We'll get results after we run it there. Then we've got our consequences all pulled in. Then our other option here is whether or not we want to perform a deterministic or probabilistic analysis. So right now, everything's set for deterministic, pulled in and as such, it's calculating a APF both with and without intervention. So if you don't have that risk, that would basically be your stopping point for this um, potential failure mode, unless you wanted to change the um, stage partitions in any way. So for the stage partitions, the spreadsheet's gonna split it up into 50 even intervals. Um, which is typically going to be good enough. If um, the data requires it, or if there's a specific spot where you want more resolution, you have the option of overriding these and changing these values to pretty much whatever you want. But we need to make sure that it's always monotonically increasing, which means as I work down the column, the values need to um, continue to increase. But for our purposes, we'll leave those alone, leave those right there, okay? So, like I was saying earlier, if um, you're doing it deterministically, you're basically done. You can click on the simulation results and see your mean system response. You can see where things plot on the FN chart. Um, if you don't have at risk open, these will be errors because you don't have any simulation results but you can, you know, that's okay. You can ignore those errors. Um, you will not have CDS unless you run a probabilistic analysis, but you do have your um, profile plots. We're plotting APF versus peak stage, average annual life loss versus peak stage, and average annual economic cost versus stage. Uh, you won't have any iteration results or anything like that. So if you are doing things probabilistically, we'll use the drop down and select that. It'll warn us that we need to use at risk. You'll notice that the Z variate distribution column now has values. Um, so really everything, everything else is the same, everything's set up and ready to go. So we will make sure that this bar is gray and that's important because once you pull that simulation result in, if you try to run a, a new simulation, it starts looking through every single one of those cells, and there's a ton of them. So it basically tanks your run time, makes it run a lot longer. So it's always good to make sure that your sim simulation results are clear before you run a simulation. Um, it's also best to make sure before you run a simulation that all your other spreadsheets are closed. I'm going to go ahead and close the stage frequency distribution spreadsheet. Got that saved other places, so I'm not going to save that. Um, I can leave this particular spreadsheet open because there's no at risk data in there. It's not going to hurt my run time too bad. I'll leave this one open because I'm going to need it later. All right, so then to run a simulation, same thing that we did for the age frequency distribution spreadsheet. We'll check our settings, make sure that multiple CPUs are disabled, smart sensitivity is disabled. I'm going to go ahead and do um, 
500 iterations, that's usually good enough to get a decent estimate of the mean. Um, you'll get better results the more iterations you do. Um, again, the 1,000 should be good enough for the mean if you want a good representation of your uncertainty scatter then you might want to up it to 10,000, but again, for the mean, 500 to 1,000 is plenty good. When you do that, it's going to ask you about uh, the correlation matrix Ds. We're going to click yes. And then a window should pop up and it should take a, a minute or two to run. So while this spreadsheet is running, are there any questions on the PFM risk spreadsheet or anything that I just covered up to this point? So I will say about the one thing I will say about these spreadsheets is the more you use them, the more comfortable you'll get with them. You know, really, once you get your data in, there's just a lot of copying and pasting. Um, the reason for multiple spreadsheets, one was so that we can keep the uh, failure mode risk separate from the project risk, which is handy during an elicitation. But then, you know, the project risk is separate from the uh, summary and plot spreadsheet because for whatever reason when you pull in um, a lot of plots into your spreadsheets and try to run it in at risk at risk regenerates those plots with every iteration so it's a major savings on your run times to have them separate even though it is a bit cumbersome um, and even still, when we start getting into standard um, projects with, say, you know, three or four failure modes, you're usually talking an hour and a half or so for a full 10,000 iteration run. So not the best. It'll make you appreciate the speed of RMC total risk that we'll get into um, next. Uh, Damon, I have a so question. Um, on the hydrologic hazard. Mm -hmm. When you're putting in the peak stages to evaluate, um, you just want to have all the stages that are going to be possibly looked at by any of the nodes, right? And 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 for each node, you need the, the minimum and maximum value, but you could do any intermediate points different from one node to the next, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Well, the other thing too, since I'm on this sheet now that I I've run it, you'll notice that I have my mean points. And that's just, again, another quick check to make sure that you brought everything over from that other spreadsheet and that the distribution's doing what we want it to do. So those points line up right on the mean curve, so things are looking good. All right. So once I've run that, I can plot all those simulation results by clicking that button right there. So it's going to pull in my iteration results, I'm going to pull in the different percentiles based on the number of iterations that I have. And then like we were talking about earlier, you'll notice that that bar, that column on the left-hand side turns red. And it's going to turn red for every spreadsheet. And again, that's just as a reminder that if you want to change data and rerun that, hey, you still got your simulation data in there, you want to be sure to clear it before running a new one. All right. Now that I have that in, when you scroll down, you'll see that we've got a scatter plot. Um, we also get the um, percentages of, of iteration results that plot are above or below specific guidelines. We've got it for our average annual life loss guideline. We've got the percentage that plot in this low probability, high consequence box. And even though we don't plot the guideline on the FN chart anymore, we get the probability of points that plot above and below the annual probability of failure guideline. And then scrolling down, you'll also see we've got our CDFs and deal with our risk profile plots. Um, these curves will get smoother with the more iterations that you do. 
and then moving further down, if for whatever reason you wanted to look at the um, data itself, you've got all the different iteration data down here in this table. We did 500 iterations. I should have data up through iteration 500, and then a bunch of not available after that because I didn't. We didn't run the rest. Then pulls in mean, min, and max from those iterations, summarizes them down here at the bottom. And then similar deal, we're pulling all the different percentiles in as well. And that's it for the PFM risk spreadsheet. Um, so now, once, once I have the PFM risk spreadsheet done and complete for each of the um, failure modes, I'm then going to copy and paste that data over into the project risk spreadsheet. Um, I got a, another question in the chat asking to go back to node one and two and explain the triangular distribution stage dependent. Sure. All right. So going back to node one, we are told to use a triangular distribution. And there's two options for the triangular distribution. It can be stage independent or it can be stage dependent. So if something is dependent on stage, that means with a change in stage, I'm going to get a change in probability. If I've got something that's stage independent, it means it doesn't matter what the stage is, I'm going to have the same probability regardless. Um, for example, if we're working on a backward erosion piping type failure mode, the probability of having uniform fine sand in the foundation, it's not dependent on the stage. It doesn't, doesn't matter what the stage is. It's either there in the foundation or it's not. So that would be an example of a stage independent failure mode. Something that would be stage dependent would be something like, um, let's say the probability of, if, if I stay with the backward erosion piping failure mode, a, um, the probability of progression. So that's going to be tied to the hydraulic gradient, which is going to be a function of the reservoir stage. So that particular node would be stage dependent. Now, if I had, if I've got, the, re, the reason they're split out in the spreadsheet is when I have something that's independent, I only need to run the distribution once. And then I can just set the, um, uh, the probability of the other stage is equal to that. What I mean by that here is like when I go to the risk calculations tab, you'll notice that I'm running a triangular distribution for that first peak stage. And then all the other ones, I'm just setting equal to the distribution that I already defined. And what that does is it allows me, it, it makes the simulation more efficient and makes things run faster. If I had selected stage dependent, the distributions would be the exact same, but it's going to run the same distribution five times instead of just once. We're going to get the same result, but it's going to take longer because there's more distributions within the simulation to run. Does that make sense? So like in comparison, when I move over to node three, I've got a distribution that for each of the inputs because they're different. I have different inputs. And I need different distributions. Gabby, does that help? Very good. Okay. All right. So this completes the inputs for PSM2. So I, and if nobody has any other questions, I'm set to start working on the project risk spreadsheet. Instead of opening up what I downloaded, I am going to open up the one for the for my solution file because I've already pulled in the data for PFM1 and PFM3. So that way when I pull in PFM2, I'll have that spreadsheet 100% complete. 
All right. All right. So when I first open the project risk spreadsheet, I'm going to come over here to the cover sheet, same project information inputs if I want to put it in. But under here, I need to input the list of all the potential failure modes that I'm evaluating. In our case, we had three different ones. And when I add the number, you'll see that it'll pull in a worksheet for that specific failure mode. So I had failure mode one, I've got failure mode two, and failure mode three. First one was overtopping. Second one was backward. Leaking typing. And the third one was concentrated leak erosion, I think. Okay. So that also gives me the option to um, select my vertical datum. Remember, the datum that I'm using needs to be consistent through all of these spreadsheets. It won't. It won't do any conversions for you. So you need to make sure they're all the same. Okay. So then there, the inputs that come into this spreadsheet are going to be tied with each of these worksheets that get added down to the bottom. Like I said prior, I've already pulled in the data for failure mode one. For failure mode three, we will work with a clean version of the spreadsheet for failure mode two. Now, that said, failure modes two, three, or however many others I would add, they all reference the hazard and the non-breach life loss from whatever your first failure mode is. And we'll show where that stuff comes in here in just a second. Let's get my cells organized. All right. So everything that's going to come into this project risk spreadsheet is going to come from the risk calculations tab of the failure mode that we're bringing in. So I had the same table for PFM1. I copied and pasted it over. I chose my interpolation method. I brought in the um, formulas for the distributions in here. And then I brought in the stage frequency relationship. And this is the same thing that's going to be referenced on all the other spreadsheets when I, um, for the other failure modes. So for here, this data right here, the entire table was copied and pasted as values into this um, specific spot. Um, and then we click execute. And when we click execute, what it's going to do is it pulls in the um, distributions for um, based on what's assigned in, this, in column H. Now, I don't have a distribution here because right now we are running things deterministically. If I change that over to probabilistic, I'm going to come back and change it back. It should lend that data. After I click execute. One thing I will warn you is that um, at risk can be sometimes finicky when you first open things. It, there'll be times where you'll have a distribution in there, it'll be typed in correctly, and for whatever reason, Excel just doesn't recognize it. I don't know if that's a Microsoft problem or, a, or an at risk problem. What's interesting is if you go to at risk's website, and look at it, they say, do a search and replace, find every equal sign and replace it with another equal sign, which that works and it doesn't take too much time, but I'm not sure why that happens. But anyway, once, once you click execute, it's gonna pull all your other data in slowly. All right, and that should all be in. I don't know why there isn't. So here's an example of what I was talking about. You'll see that I have the proper formula in here, but that I have this name error for the expected value. 
And that's just because Excel is just not recognizing it. So I can click into the formula, formula bar and click enter. Now all of a sudden I get a value, or like I was saying earlier, we can hit control F and find equal signs and then replace with equal signs. That way it forces Excel to look through everywhere that you've got a formula but doesn't change anything. Kind of annoying, but it is what it is. Then I gotta wait for it to obviously. So it made it over 6,000 replacements, but now everything's pulling in correctly. Okay. All right, so that's where the uh, stage frequency data would go. And, come on. And then the other thing that the other PFM sheets are gonna reference are gonna be the non-breach consequences. So these values and the distribution used are gonna be the exact same for all the other failure modes. And how those were brought in were shown in the uh, presentation video. All right, so let's get to uh, PFM2 and start bringing that stuff in. So when you first get your um, second spreadsheet there, you'll notice that there's a triangle here. We're gonna press that button to populate the formulas the first time that we use this worksheet. The reason that that is because this, spread, this, this whole workbook is set up for 10 potential failure modes. And then for runtime purposes, if all those formulas had been in there for all 10 failure modes, Again, it kills your runtime. So for now, they're cleared out until you want to use it. So we'll, we'll press that button and it's going to pull in all the appropriate formulas and get the spreadsheet ready for us the rest of the way. Take a minute. There's a lot of calculations in the sheet. Then it'll bring us back up to the top. All right, also let's go ahead and go back. I think right now it's still set to be probabilistic. Yeah, let's, let's leave it because I'm gonna wanna run it probabilistically. The, uh, again, the, the steps are the exact same for deterministic. So whatever I set on in that first worksheet, probabilistic or deterministic, it's gonna be the same for all the other spreadsheets. Uh, in the workbook. All right, so now I'm set to pull in data from the PFM risk spreadsheet. Everything's formatted pretty much exactly the same. You've got the um, instructions up here, but you can pretty much just look at the data and pull it in and know where it needs to go. So I'm gonna take this table that summarizes the team elicitation and system response then I'm going to copy and paste it as values here. Again, everything's coming from this risk calculation tab. Um, next, I'm going to make sure that I have the same interpolation method, which I do. And then now I need to pull in um, all my distributions. And this time, I'm going to want to paste formulas. Highlight that all. Paste that here and choose the one that has the FX in the corner so that they're formulas. Those are set. And again, as I'm pulling in, I should be seeing the same data here for my iteration results. I should be getting the same values. I'm doing the exact same calculation. Looks good. Like I said before, for your, your second, third, fourth, and however many failure modes you have, the stage frequency on those spreadsheets are gonna reference whatever was input for your first potential failure mode. Because your stage frequency curve is gonna be consistent between all of the different failure modes. So that's all brought in and good to go. Uh, exposure should be the same, so that's also brought in from that first failure mode. Now I have the spot to put in my um, breach life loss for day and night. So let's scroll down. 
Again, it's going to be the table right here. I'm going to pull in everything over to so basically column C through column G to paste those values. That's my day. We'll pull in the night. And then I need to select the distribution we're using. We're using the beta perk. I'll pull beta perk from the drop down. And then when I click execute here, it's going to populate all these cells with a perk distribution. Now, if you were doing this deterministically, when I click execute, it's going to pull in the mean value uh, for the selected distribution. So it would be, like in this case, it would be the min plus four times the most likely plus the max all divided by six. Um, that's going to give you a good estimate of your, um, your mean risk. Um, and so we've got that in. And then the last piece we need our Economic costs, we'll pull that in. And again, I mentioned this earlier. You'll see, again, it's okay that these elevations don't match these elevations for the calculation purposes. But we get into summarizing the data, you'll see how this offsets things in the summary sheet. So. During a risk assessment, your, your consequence person, your economist, they're going to do runs for, for, for specific peak stages. The same model that's used to estimate the life loss also estimates the economic damage at the same time. So there's never going to be a situation where you have life loss for a value but don't have um, the economic damages associated with it. So as you're putting in your data, you will want these values to line up with these values. For this specific example, they don't. And I'll, that's to illustrate something. I'll show you that here in a little bit. All right. So that's in. Again, the non-breach is referencing the non-breach that we put in on the prior worksheet. And then same deal for um, the analysis type. With that, that is, oh, there's one more set of inputs I forgot. So the stage partitions are also going to reference whatever you put in for your first failure mode. So I had copied and pasted those over earlier. Those are the same ones from the PFM rest spreadsheets. Okay. So that gives me everything I need for. Uh, failure mode two, all those inputs are in there. Um, I've already populated it with the ones from failure mode one to failure mode three. So then the next step, I need to go to the SRP adjustments tab and choose my risk model. But before I do that, it looks like I've got some errors in PS3. And it looks probably because at risk is not recognizing my distributions, if I had to guess, which is true. So if I find and replace my equal signs, that'll clear that up for me. Which does. All right. So back over there. So on the SRP adjustments tab, I've got the option of choosing, you know, several different risk models. We can use the exclusive risk model, common cause adjustment, or the competing risk model. Um, again, common cause is what's most traditionally used. Um, and click that and click execute, and it'll get the spreadsheet set up for you. Um, it gives you the option to assign a dominant failure mode. We don't have a dominant failure mode in this case, so those will all be no. If you wanted to change it, you could pick yes or no. Now keep in mind, only one failure mode can be dominant. 
So if you assign a dominant failure mode, what that's doing is it puts one failure mode out on its own branch within the event tree and makes the other failure modes conditional on that specific failure mode not occurring. So basically I would have the probability, let's say if I had one in failure mode one to be dominant, I would have failure mode one, breach or no breach, and then off the no breach branch is where I would have the other failure mode. So if failure mode one was a, had a high probability of failure, then that would be reducing the um, other couple failure modes quite a bit. So that, I think that was covered back in module two. But at any rate, for our homework, we're going to choose no for all three of those. And then the other inputs here come from this part where we have the adjustment for combining similar failure modes. So if, for example, failure modes one and two had been basically the same failure mode, but with two, but with different exit two. locations. Right. That's all I have to do. Is there a question? Um, let's say there had been two failure modes, same cross section, but with different exit locations. Maybe one was heat at the toe, and maybe one was a little longer path into the, you know, the daylight at a slope or ditch. We would want the maximum between those two failure modes. And this is where you would do that. You would write an if statement basically saying if, um, if the probability of Failure mode one is greater than two, then I want that one to count. If not, then zero. So basically it would compare, and then we would do the same thing over here, where, but flip it where if failure mode two was greater than failure mode one, then it would be a one, else it would be a zero. So basically it's, it's, it's looking and comparing to see which one to include. I don't want to include both in the total calculation if they're similar. Um, in our case, we were told these are different failure modes at different sections. We have overtopping, we have backward erosion piping, we have concentrated leak. Each of these is going to get a one value because we want 100% of it included in its contribution to the total. So I can punch in ones there, drag it all the way down, and copy and paste that over for the with intervention. We've got to do it twice. All right, so those come in. Just to reiterate, this is our unadjusted system response probabilities, also known as your marginal system response probabilities. And this is an opportunity to adjust for um, similar failure modes. And then the spreadsheet is going to do the common cause adjustment. Now, this is the, um, that's going to be the amount of reduction that we get for the common cause. And in this case, the common cause really doesn't make much difference at all. If we go out a few more decimal places, you'll see that it's going to reduce each failure mode a little bit. Are all pretty similar. And then scrolling down, um, this is the part of the table where a dominant failure mode um, is accounted for. And then this gives you the actual adjusted system response probabilities when you're done. Okay. These are the system response probabilities that the uh, spreadsheet's going to use when doing the total risk calculation. All right, so that was the final set of inputs for the project risk spreadsheet. We go back to failure mode two. Let's walk through this table real quick. You'll see the spots where we have our stage partitions. So the spreadsheet finds the midpoint peak stage. Uh, it interpolates and calculates our loading probability. We have our exposures and life loss for both day and night, our economic loss. 
we calculate the marginal risk, and we've got spots where it's um, pulling in our contribution to the total, how our adjustment is working there. And then, let's see, so I think that covers everything. All right. So from there, we are, we should be set to run things. Um, these, these values show up again if I, I'll replace the equal signs on all the different sheets. You can see how that's incredibly annoying. It takes a minute. So again, part of that goes up because when you're bouncing back and forth between deterministic and probabilistic, again, for whatever reason, Excel just does not like to recognize those distributions. Let's wait for that to run here. Particularly the incremental risk, the non-bracing residual risk spreadsheets are, as like you see there, 498,000 <laughs> Uh, equation there, so that's where that issue is coming in. So, okay. Probably going to have to do the same thing on the non breach and residual risk. All right. So, there's that one. I would do the same thing here for the non breach and the residual risk. I've got one that's already completed and run, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to switch spreadsheets and pull the one that has the same data pulled over the correct answers in there. So let's go ahead and get rid of this. I'm not going to save that. I'm going to pull up the solution file, which should be this guy right here. So I'll get that out of the way. All right. So this is the, again, the same spreadsheet, but with all the data in there, and this also is with, it has the, the simulation run already. Um, it should ask you when you first open it if you want the simulation file. If it doesn't, you can click open simulation file here, and then find the simulation file that goes with your project and pull that in. Pretty sure it's already in there. Um, and then you get your results and you can See the risk summary broken out between incremental, non breach, and residual. Also broken down with your marginal failure mode risk and then the total common cause adjusted total down here. Um, so then from there, we're ready to uh, link this up to our risk plots and summary spreadsheet to um, plot all our data. So it was kind of a lot. Uh, is there any questions on um, how to pull things from the PFM risk spreadsheet into the project risk spreadsheet? Not. We'll go ahead and pull in, open up the risk summary and plot spreadsheet. All right, so let's put those side by side. All right, so the risk summary and plot spreadsheet links with the project risk spreadsheet to pull in on all our data and the plot things. So on our cover sheet, we have a, an input for the link spreadsheet name. So we need to put the spreadsheet name in exactly um, as it's shown um, with the uh, file extension as well. So we're going to punch in 03 
RMC object risk version 1.1 xlsb. And if we did it right, it should link up and pull in the different PFM numbers. It's short um, description here in just a sec. Yeah. I didn't punch in the short description names, but if I did, it will pull it over into the um, the other spreadsheet. Now, again, you, you can change your project risk spreadsheet name to whatever you want, but when you do, once you punch in here, it needs to be the same. And your project risk spreadsheet needs to be open at the same time as your results and plot spreadsheet to um, when you're trying to pull stuff over. So we will let that let, let that calculate here for a second. Sometimes it takes a minute. But then once that's all in, all your data and plot you pull in. So I've got my summary data for my hydrologic hazard. I've got the plot of that with the output data. See how things line up on the curves. I've got my non-breach tables with the life loss and economic costs pulled in. Lots of those. A lot of handy plots and data that are getting pulled into these spreadsheets. So then when you get to the PFM risk, you've got, you need to use the dropdown to pull in the data for which potential failure mode you want to look at. We were working with PFM2. We'll go ahead and click that. It'll take a minute to calculate. And again, it's going to pull in our data from PFM2. If I had punched in the short description, I will pull it in there so we'll have the PFM number and then the short description that's shown there. We've got that same table. We've got plots of our mean system response. We've got our system response probabilities without intervention and with intervention with all the uncertainty data, all the different percentiles, exposure. So here's what I was talking about if your peak stages and economic costs don't line up. You'll see I've got data in here for the life loss for those peak stages, but then I've got the economic cost that doesn't line up quite right. That was because I was missing a stage in the economic cost. So again, to make sure that that doesn't happen, the peak stages that we have for life loss also need to have a corresponding economic cost. They need to be the same set. Um, and then past that, you've got all the same plots for the life loss that we were looking at, and then your economic cost. We've got our FN scatter plot for that particular failure mode, all the same things that we saw for the PFM risk spreadsheet, your CDS, APF versus stage, so on and so forth. Okay. Then on the last tab, that's going to be my total risk summary that pull, pulls in the residual risk summary table, incremental risk summary table for each of the failure modes in the total. Without have our FN chart without uncertainty. So we did it deterministically. It should look. You should have sent me a plot that looks something like that. And then here's the uh, uncertainty scatter for the total. So very similar to what we were looking at for the individual failure modes. We've got the percentages for the different guidelines, the mean values, both with and without intervention. Now the only other input that's required is going to be your uh, for the individual most at risk. We need to input the fatality rate for that specific individual or group. Um, that's going to come from your economist. And 
Our computer sync in first second. It doesn't crash. But you put in whatever value that was. Let's, I didn't ask you to create this plot, but let's say they told me the fatality rate was 0.65. You punch that value in there. And then after the spreadsheet calculates, it will give you the uncertainty for with and without event intervention for the individual most at risk. Um, we also have our big FN charts with the incremental, the non-breach, and the residual all on one plot, which is pretty handy. You can get a good sense of your, uh, basically your total flood risk just from that one plot and from where it's coming from. And then we also have the uncertainty associated with each of those. So that's um, the incremental risk without intervention, incremental risk with intervention, non-breach risk. Uh, then we've got our same plot for our um, economics, our F dollar chart. And then all the corresponding CDS risk profile plots, so on and so forth. Okay. So that wraps up um, demonstration for homework four. Are there any questions on anything that I've discovered? Again, feel free to ask your question over the phone or punch it into the, the chat. Fairly straightforward. I mean, I know there's a lot of copying and pasting and making sure that you're punching things in into the correct spot, but you know, when we were putting these spreadsheets together, we tried to keep the um, formatting the same from one to the other so you know it was easy to tell where things went and where to copy and paste and um, try to make it as user-friendly and as efficient as possible. Um, when you get into module five, you'll really appreciate the speed and the efficiency of which total risk will run. So you'll basically be asked in the homework for module five to recreate this particular example, but using that program and the run will be a matter of seconds instead of something much longer. Well, good deal. Um, if there are no questions, then let's close out of this. And let's talk about module five briefly. While I'm closing things out, the, um, the buzzword um, for this mod is going to be uncertainty. Uncertainty is going to be the buzzword this go around. All right. Let's talk quiz and uh, module five real quick. So, per usual, to take the quiz and to get credit for your uh, attending the live Q&A session, go through and for module four, the room name is going to be DLS 105R4. Um, we punch your name in just like we've done before. You can take that quiz. Remember, we need to get the buzzword right to get credit. And that buzzword is uncertainty. And then for module five, most every, everything should be up on the um, course website. Um, one thing that you'll notice is we do not have the actual uh, presentation for module five, and mostly because it's all a bunch of screen captures or um, where Adam is going through total risk and stepping through it. So the actual presentations would be like one slide per um, function, just however many videos or clips that he took to put it together. So it wasn't very helpful. So that's why there really isn't a presentation that goes along with it. You can still find the transcript there. 
um, the Module 5 videos in the same place as all the other ones. But you'll find it there. You can go through it. Um, you will need RMC Total Risk to um, complete Module 5, and you can find that here. And that'll take you to where you can um, download the zip file for it. Now, keep in mind that this program is it's still in beta. It hasn't officially been released just yet. They are super close. I think I would expect it to be on the uh, official RMC website within the next month or so. But you know, the kind of changes that they're making are minor stuff that they're getting cleaned up. So um, the beta version should give you a good feel for a, a good introduction for how to use the program and how to do calculations using it. You can download that there. Um, if you have any trouble with the zip file or you know, if your IT department tries to block anything, let me know and we'll see if there's different ways to try to get you these uh, this particular program. Um, there are Installation instructions that are covered in the presentation. They are also covered in the uh, participant workbook. We want to make sure that you know you, you go through those step by step and um, do that right to make sure that you can get that program up and working on your particular computer. So that's these. We've got the different steps after you get the zip file downloaded, extracting things, and actually where to um, put the files from the zip file on your computer. They're going to need to be on your D drive. So if you're working on a government computer, you got to keep it away from um, your user folder. It needs to be on the actual C drive of your computer. Play, pay particularly close attention to where you're downloading that and following those instructions. Um, there's a good chance you're also probably going to have to right click the executable and unblock it like we've been doing with all our macro enabled spreadsheets. That is it. The um, homework files should also be up there on the website where all the other ones are.